Okay, Dan, I see beets. What's going on here? Well, we're in the middle of November and we're actively harvesting on the farm at this time of year. And I think it, it's a testament to what you can be doing in your home garden, particularly if you live in a milder climate like us in the Pacific Northwest here, even some colder climates, there's an amazing amount of food that you can harvest even during these miserable rainy periods of the year. So I'm gonna show you the golden beets that we're harvesting here. They're gonna be a lot bigger than what you might be familiar with as uh, what you may be harvesting at home. This is a golden beet called Touchstone Gold. And I'm stripping off some of the outer leaves here uh, just to clean them up. And we're marketing this product in, in, in the store uh, as is. So I'm just gonna be giving this a quick wash inside and we'll be putting this on the shelf today for consumption today. And that's the uh, luxury that we have and the flexibility that we have as market gardeners is we can provide perfectly quality food the day that it's gonna be consumed. And you'll be doing that, of course, in your home garden as well. So Touchstone Gold is a variety. It's an open pollinating variety. And we planted these or seeded these in late July. Early August is kind of the, the cutoff for us. And these have been growing extremely fast uh, through that period initially. And then now during the colder season, they seem to sweeten up, flavor intensifies, color uh, becomes more uh, vibrant. And uh, this makes such a wonderful food for this time of year. So golden beets, I think are a must for you as a home gardener. I chose Touchstone Gold be as an open pollinating variety because we can save seed from them. And all that would entail is saving some of these massive beets, planting them in the field in the spring, and then harvesting seed for the next year. So there's lots of really cool things we can do with open pollinating varieties. Now let's move on and talk about sunchokes. I've got sunchokes along the fence over here. I'm going to grab another basket and we'll harvest uh, sunchokes as well. So what I like about sunchokes is they make a really great border crop. So we grew them along the fence here where we have our pastures for the cows and the alpacas. And you'll notice that uh, sunchokes are quite prone to blow over. So what I could have easily done here is tied them up to the fence. So we dropped in one or two small tubers in the spring right up here. We actually had roasted sunchokes last night for dinner. What a great food. So we planted probably this size tuber in the spring. Wow. And the yield is incredible. incredible. Like is that, you know, 40, 50 fold uh, return. That's amazing. And what we have here is food all winter. And these actually do really well just left in the ground if you can keep the rodents away of course and so this is also it's a very profitable crop for us because it doesn't take a lot of work to grow and we're growing it right along the fence line here with deliberation anything that pokes through the cows are going to eat so the cows get great food it also allows us to keep the border along the fence clean and free of weeds and that to us is a game changer because I don't have to go along to the weed eater. We don't have weeds growing up in our fence line and uh, um, the other issues that might come with that, say grounding shock wire or any other problems with weeds along the fence. So from one little planting, I'm probably going to be getting close to 50, 50 pound return here. That's so, awesome. Yeah, another really fun crop to grow. They are, and I can Artichoke. tell you, I've been to Restaurant 62, and uh, that's what they were selling. Yeah. Your Jerusalem artichoke is fantastic. They're, uh, they're really appreciated by restaurants. They sure are. They're, they're unique and different, and they have this real earthy, earthy flavor. That, uh, Beautiful, just... and they, they also seem to don't, don't mind the cold weather. They love the cold weather. They, they do really well. So these won't actually freeze, even if they were exposed above ground. We're getting as low as minus 10. They're going to uh, preserve their goodness through those, that, that cold weather.
Beautiful. Let's take a look at some of the brassica crops that we have. Okay. Looks like the rain actually stopped here, which I'm glad for. But harvesting just keeps happening. No matter if it's raining or snowing, well, we have to keep bringing food in for the market. All right, hop on. Okay, let's do it. have here is our storage varieties of cabbage. Uh, they need a longer growing season so we have to get these in on time and if we're too late they're just not going to form a head for us. So what variety is this and when did you plant? Uh, this is a variety called Wirosa. That's a Savoy cabbage. These ones were actually planted just on the limit, so they're actually going to size up quite a bit, yeah? You get quite a, a plant off here, if you see right over here. So you get a fairly large plant. What we're actually selling is mostly just the inside, so I'm just going to come right in here, give that a sever the head, and this is uh, the part that we'll actually be selling. It's but of all course, edible though. Yeah, as a home gardener, you definitely would, you'd take that in as well. So uh, for us, that's going to stay out in the field. We'll leave most of the plant there. It'll actually shoot up from the center here and it'll try to force out seed for next spring. And those heads can then be harvested as well. And they're really succulent and tasty if you get them at the right time. That's awesome. So we're Rosa and then we have a storage cabbage here. These are uh, very firm, hard cabbages that actually preserve really, really well. So if you were in a really cold area, they're not going to be taking much more than minus 10. And so you'd probably want to get these into storage. And the way to do that is with wood chips. It's a great way to store cabbage. So you put the cabbages, you lay some wood chips on the ground, you do this outdoors, you put the cabbages in uh, on, on that layer of wood chips more wood chips on top. If you live in a very cold area, more wood chips yet. And then you dig them out in the month of April of the following year. So they store really, really well. Man, that's a real gem. Thank yeah, you. and they're that's really, awesome. you know, this is a probably a good 10 pounds. And we've easily got these up to 15 pounds before. That's incredible. So these cabbages grow really big. And then if we step over here, you can see uh, some other varieties of storage cabbage, I've gone through here pretty good and a lot of the purples have been harvested. This is Ruby Perfection, I believe, this variety. Okay, these can get a lot bigger than this as well. And then over here we have a variety called, I believe this one's called Dead On, but it's a strain of the January King, traditional uh, January King cabbages that preserve really well and as the name implies, bring out their best in the month of January when people are not really thinking about harvesting from their gardens anymore. Uh, a wonderful keeper. Okay, so these have gone through the most extreme winters that we've had. They, they'll preserve right through. I think and they have get a beautiful like minus, Savoy. Minus 10 kind of max here. Is it sometimes it's yeah. a little bit colder, but... We might get minus 15, um, but even then, these will, these will preserve through that, provided you have the proper drainage and you have the suitable conditions for the plant. The other way to think about maybe preserving cabbages through the winter is to mulch around them and to provide them with a bit of insulation. Again, wood chips, hay are two things that come to mind. And of course, 
you're also applying a really important gardening concept and that is cover the ground with decaying plant material. So those savoys um, are also great keepers, okay? They can take injure remarkable cold weather and it actually brings out the better flavors again. Very cool. What else you got? Well, we're gonna head over to uh, the farther side of the farm and we're gonna harvest celery, celeriac, and leeks. So let's go. Let's do it. It's gonna be a bit of a bumpy ride. I can assure you of that. We've had a good two inches of rain in the last 24 hours, and it really shows. Actually, why don't we pick some cauliflower while we're here? Yeah. I just, I love these giants, these decaying giants yeah. in here that I know I remember seeing them in the summer and it's just so wonderful seeing how much uh, life is attracted to these, the birds, the uh, even the mice and, and uh, other critters on the ground. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, rodents that are attracted to this and um, amazingly, they're leaving the brassicas alone as well, so they're not—they're uh, not a problem. They're part of the soil food web, and we—we well, we have to remember. I, you know, I kind of—I—I I wanted to mention that for a reason. Is that you know, rats and, and rodents—they're a real thing, and in I think in the right balance, they're not a pest. And I think yeah. it's—I just feel like you've created the conditions here where they've got a, more of a natural habitat where they yeah they can go ahead and I mean you're not obviously you're not selling these. Right. So, well, I think we, we have to remember that um, from a, a soil food web perspective, there's no good guys or, or bad guys. Exactly. There's just imbalance, and imbalance is what's bad. Yeah. Um, even something like E. coli, immediately where everybody's alarmed and think this is the worst thing out there. Well, when it's in, in, not in the right balance, there's, we have huge problems. But we know that E. coli also provides benefits as well in, in the soil food web context. Absolutely, very cool. Well, thanks for that little detour. Let's check this yeah. out. Um, so broccolis, not huge this time of year. It seems like, you know, you, you're just not gonna get the same size. These, this is a variety called Gypsy, and I recommend you grow this one as a, as a home gardener. I'm deliberately leaving the stems long. They're very succulent, and um, Again, you can eat the whole plant. As a home gardener, of course you would be eating the whole plant. Let's take a look at some of these cauliflowers. Here's a green variety called Vita Verde. Okay, so oh, green. These are just so gorgeous. Yeah, they uh, kind of resemble the Romanesco type cauliflowers that you can grow. Um, well, and when you think about this time of year, it's just so drab here in the PNW, and yet there's this like those touchstone beets. It's just this beautiful pop of color. Just right. brightens up. Look the, at that. Oh, this man. is Flame Butter. Star cauliflower. There's also a variety called Cheddar, which they actually brighten up. The more sun you get, the more exposure they have to the light, the brighter they get. So this one was really quite uh, tucked in there. Let's find one that's maybe a little more exposed. We can see here, again, we have one that's quite tight yet i probably wouldn't pick it at that stage but if we move down yeah, we that's might a, that's a good point i mean you're you're going uh obviously you're a pro you're coming in here and you're harvesting so quickly uh let's talk just very briefly so would you harvest this one this is yeah once you're fully exposed like this i would bring this in the danger of leaving it out is it getting eaten by caterpillars which are actually still moving about at this time you can see probably caterpillar poop down at, at the bottom there um, and and they're gonna you know they're gonna do what nature does and that's that's uh, if there's there's food available if there's nutrient available yeah. then their job is to tie up that nutrient and lock it away for future right 
Um, but we want to get access to the nutrients before the insects do. Yeah. And that's what we're, we're doing right here. Well, you do a beautiful job here. You know, one of the things that yeah. continues to blow my mind is how you don't have any row covers. You don't use any row covers. All market gardeners, you take any market gardening course and you see, or you see anyone, even, uh, it doesn't matter where, the biggest of yeah. them all, they're using row covers and yet you don't have to, as you can see here. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because I, I despise the use of plastics if, if at all possible. We use them in the greenhouses and I see them almost as inevitable um, in, in that context, but floating row covers in this environment, we're finding, you know, with the cabbage butterfly, the aphids, uh, flea beetle, you know, any number of, of pests that seem to target brassicas, uh, if you do one thing well, and that's build soil fertility, if you have great soil fertility, uh, the pest seem to, to be kept in check by the good guys. It's not that we don't have the pests, they're present. I know I just talked about some of the caterpillars that we could have on these things. But these things, these cabbages, cauliflowers are growing so rapidly that the pests just don't have a chance to keep up. Yeah. And um, you can see it in the vibrancy of, of the leaf, right? We've got uh, really bright color. I must say we're not producing massive heads here. It, that's attributed to the, to the time of the year. Uh, we have less sunshine. We live in a very dark part of the world here on the 49th parallel. You know, we don't have that uh, yeah. amount of light that we might need to really size these up. We have the heat, but uh, photosynthesis obviously is important in order for us to maximize size. Yeah, um, One, so back to the, the uh, pest resistance. If someone, you wanna Google it, it's called SAR. It's the SAR response of the plant and it's the plant's genetic ability to resist pest pressure. And if you have healthy soil, your plants are able to, as you can see, look at that. This is the most valuable part. Look at this, gorgeous, untouched. You can see clearly something's been eating the leaves, but they haven't been able to win. They haven't been able to take over. And that's what you get when you make great compost, you build great soil fertility, yeah. and you follow these the principles that we talk about in the garden course. Right, cover the ground with living plant material. We're covering the ground with living plants, obviously here. Uh, cover the ground with decaying plant material, and that's what we do with the mulch down around the plant base. Um, you can see we have a, a, a pretty healthy layer of mulch here and uh, build great compost. And following those three basic principles, you are, are guaranteed success. Maybe not in your first year, but uh, definitely if these soil practices are continued, you're going to, you're going to notice some incredible results. Beautiful. All right, uh, as promised, leeks, celeriac, celery All right. on the far side of the farm. Let's go for a little drive. Yeah, we carrots, okay. Uh, this is a variety called gold nugget. Um, anybody who says you can't grow carrots with a lot of wood chips, well, yes you can. Lots of wood chips. Remember the wood chips are on the surface. They're not deeper down, okay. Deeper down we have decomposted uh, wood chips. Fungally dominant soil growing carrots. Okay, again, all that talk about, you know, you can't have a lot of wood. Yes, you can. So these carrots here, um, this is, we're gonna sell these as a winter carrot. This is a variety called Gold Nugget. It's by far, in my opinion, the best yellow variety of carrot out there. They're not huge. We prefer to do our winter carrots at Christmas. Um, this time of year is a little smaller, come more like a snacking carrot, okay? Great flavor. Um, the rule for us is we're not going to pick these until after the first frost. So we just ought to be a little patient here. We haven't even got a frost yet. I know it's incredible. November 13 or whatever it is. So yeah, so I just wanted to, to show this. Um, weed free, okay? We don't do weeds in organic 
no-till gardening. Okay? We don't have time for weeds. In fact, weeds actually don't like to live in fungally dominant uh, soils. Yeah. And uh, that's what we're striving, striving to do here. Yeah, we talk about that more in the garden course. We'll talk about that at the end of this video. You bet. Yeah. These beds over here, we have overwinter onions. That's a variety called high keeper. And those were seeded early September. You can see another bunch of beds over here, early September. Again, lots of wood chips as our uh, primary source of mulch. And you don't necessarily need to use wood chips. There are other options available in different regions. We use wood chips because that's what's readily available. Sorry about the bumps. beds okay as a general rule you should not have anything bare and exposed to the elements so you should have a living mulch in your in your beds okay so not great practice but if you don't have a living mulch the best you can do is with a decomposing plant material some celery right here. Yeah. I'm just I'm continually blown away with how much you can grow in I'm gonna sound like a weakling here in a cold climate. You know it's yeah. it's actually not that cold here. But relatively um, speaking we're relatively speaking yeah I'm we're quite just continuing to be amazed. Celery, this is a variety called Tango, again an open pollinating variety that we feature actually in our free online uh, e-course that, that people could subscribe to. So this, um, this variety actually can hold up really well to the cold. And how low can it go? Probably minus five or six. And a lot of that depends on how much wind is associated with, with, the, with the cold. So these will go on for a while yet. I mean, I'm hoping we don't get a, a significant cold spell for a little while. And what we're also noticing is, is some of the stems are actually uh, showing a bit of, of, a bit of uh, suffering because of the wet. Yeah, they actually, so the outer leaves tend to, you know, they, they brown up and we get a bit of this, this mold. We'll peel them away and what we're left with is a really happy, good looking celery. And of course, the more organic matter, the more humus you have in your soil, the more water it can hold on to uh, without creating pooling, improves drainage. And of course, we talked about in the course of drainage and how important it is and, and what you've done on the farm here. Yeah, you want to get, uh, you want to have good oxygen down below. Good aeration is important. Well, that's just it. They're not fish. They're exactly. plants. Yeah. Should we have a quick look at the the uh, Brussels sprouts that are totally doable without, again, uh, floating row cover. Uh, if we just move in here, get a ways to just hack one of these. You almost need a hatchet for these things. You can see here um, a, a really nice return. There's a little bit of pest damage on some of the bottom ones. These top ones will actually keep sizing up. We're not planning to harvest these until Christmas. Yeah, I remember we did ours uh, in January last year. I was so pleasantly surprised. And the flavor, again, due to that cold, yeah. just sharpens them up beautifully. This is a mid-July, early July to mid-July planting from transplant. And then we also do some of the other colors here. 
this variety, I think it's called Red Ball. You can see these have a little ways to go yet on, on sizing. Yeah. But they'll actually keep growing even through some of these cooler, darker days. So yeah, really excited about uh, the potential for Brussels sprouts. So for those of you who thought you can't grow them in this area without uh, herb, uh, pesticides, you can. Uh, here's proof you can. Okay, yeah. there's a little bit of damage on the bottom here that might be attributed to possibly slugs or maybe caterpillars, but in general, we're gonna have a really awesome harvest off, off these guys here. Yeah, brassicas for days. Yeah. And they're so good for you. Google sulforaphane. It's a great video by Dr. Rebecca something. It's falling out of my head, but I want to know why they're so healthy. Sulforaphane. All right. more flooding over in this area. Well, we just had how many millimeters of rain? This was... I think it was two inches. It was pretty heavy. And yeah. uh, for those of you who don't live in the PNW, it can rain for about 60 days straight between October and November sometimes. We get a, we're in a rainforest. But this water won't stay here for very long. That's the main thing. As long as the water is out of here within 24 hours after a good rain, you know you got adequate drainage. So these guys, um, these leeks, as a no-till grower, minimal disturbance. That's the general rule, right? So I want to leave those roots in the ground intact. These plants would just be peeled back. Let's peel off some of the the outer leaves, and uh, this is what we end up with. The entire plant, again, is edible. Let's do another one. Get you in here close so you can sure. see what Dan's doing. So I'm gonna give it one snip right there, pull it up a little bit, give it another cut, leave the roots intact, as if nothing ever was there. Let's take right? a look, look at that, that knife real quick. This is a special sure. kind of knife you can see. Perfect for harvesting. Yeah. And then you can see that root left in the ground to feed the microbes. Don't forget the beetle. I mean, they're, yeah, he's in here. They're hustling and bustling about uh, on the surface and those are uh, predatorial, predatorial insects. Again, I'm referencing the soil food web, but I want you to be aware of the essential role that every organism plays in the soil food web. Yeah, so, there's none of this good and evil. They, they work together. There's, you want to see them as predator and there's prey. And in balance, they will regulate each other. And it's the, really the plant that stimulates it by feeding the microbes in the soil that are then eaten by the higher members of the soil food web. Really, we think of ourselves as the farmer, but it's, it's the plants that are really farming and controlling all the other life that's around them. It's very cool. And we talk a lot more about that, of course, in the course. Yeah, I think our role is, as gardeners is really to provide the conditions for the soil food web to thrive and flourish. It's, it's really that simple. I mean, we always think of ourselves as vegetable growers or fruit growers or whatever we're doing, but really we're microbe farmers and that's what we ought to be is what are the conditions that the microbes in the soil need to survive and, yes. and so that they can enhance plant vigor and, and taste and plant performance, plant immunity, plant, uh, you know, plants have built-in natural immunity, but they need to have 
the right essential nutrients in order to do that, even including uh, trace minerals. Absolutely. There's a very bu good book uh, called Teeming with Microbes that you might want to check out. That's a good jumping off point to get in introduced to the soil food web. What else have you got here? Let's slosh through the muck here. Notice that, that in the bed there's, it, it's almost comfortable still walking in the beds. Uh, the driveway is horrible because that's been chewed up. Um, and that's what we want. Uh, we want to make sure that when we're in the field, in our beds, um, we preserve the integrity of the soil so we don't bring a tractor in at this time of the year. Celeriac. Um, I always get told by people that this is a really tough one to grow. I think I know why. They're heavy feeders. They need consistent moisture throughout the growing season. And they take a little while to, to, to get to size. So these bottom leaves will just peel off. They can actually endure quite a bit of, of uh, water. So again, we're going to leave the roots intact here. And I'm just going to cut around the plant. Looks that's what we're, we're left with here. So I'm just going to take that after to the wash area. We'll give that a scrub. And beautiful. that's, uh, yeah, they are. They're really beautiful. When did these go plants. in? These were planted uh, probably mid-June. Okay. It was more like 115 days to maturity. And uh, of course, at this time of year, on the once we get into the fall, uh, days to maturity, of course, you can't say it's going to be 110 days anymore because we just got a lot of less photosynthetic action right now. We have a lot of less heat. So these might actually, you know, from a June planting might actually be more like 140 days or 150 days to maturity, given that most of their lifespan would have been spent um, in the colder season. Okay, so leaving uh, as much nutrient in the ground as possible. Notice that the greens that I'm harvesting are going right back onto the surface. Chop and drop. Exactly, so that we can um, rely, you know, this will protect the soil, okay, provide habitat for organisms, and then further to that, they're also going to uh, break up the size of the water droplets that, you know, when we get those good rains, they're going to hit the greens, break up, so that we're not pounding the soil yeah. and breaking apart important uh, soil aggregation that uh, the bacteria and the fungi are uh, responsible for. Celeriac, so what else do we have this time of year? Last week we actually harvested sweet corn, believe it or not. It. You yeah. can bring them really late into the season. Uh, fava beans is another one that you could be doing this time of year. Green onion, uh, well into this time of the year. And uh, probably a bunch of uh, rutabagas, turnips, radishes. We're still harvesting salad mixes and, and the like. So there's a, a ton of food that, that we as market gardeners are growing and that I want you to grow as a home gardener as well. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be taking people uh, who join the gardening course right through the, the seasons of the year, starting with this most terrible time of the year for, for, for growing. You know, it's just really, um, the conditions just aren't great. Um, but we wanna take people from the fall through the winter. What can you do in your garden through the winter months? What can you do in your compost pile through the winter months? And then we wanna take people into the more exciting time of the year, the, the spring, and then all the bounty and the abundance that we get in the summer, and then back in, into the fall. And so that's uh, the intention with the gardening course is to help you build uh, confidence in the garden, to experiment with, you know, we'll provide you with some hand-holding, okay? We will take you along with us, but then the idea is that you're going to be able to stand on your own two feet, make good decisions based on your context, the, the environment that you live in, um, the climatic conditions that you have, your soil type, and, and on and on. Yeah, these principles, working with nature, do as nature does, right? They will work no matter where you live on the planet. If you set yourself to work with nature, to work with the indigenous biology, the soil food web, to see, you do what Dan, you can see Dan is doing here is, he's feeding, he's always feeding, right? You're farming very intensively while building soil. And there's an yeah. awesome seven or eight minute video that we filmed earlier this summer where Dan took us to clay 
uh, what the farm originally was. Over uh, to my left back here, we took a sample and then Dan took us over to where he was growing the beets and you can just see what this building of soil has that has taken place while he's farming intensively. It's incredible. So when you work with nature, you can do that. It's not a myth. You really mm -hmm. can build soil, harvest tons and tons, and yet still be building and building into this battery, storing carbon into the ground. Carbon sequestration is so important. And it's amazing when you work with nature, it's a win-win. Yeah. Andrew, can I grab that camera and um, we'll, we'll focus on you for a second here. And I want you to just talk about uh, composting and some of the great work that, that you're doing in, for sure. uh, in your compost facility. Yeah, so you can actually, you can see the compost windrows behind us. And I, I showed you a little bit as we drove by, but composting is so critical. And although you can see there's, there's a lot here, it actually doesn't take a whole lot. And when you apply principles like cover cropping and leaving living roots in the ground, you're continuing, you're composting in place. And so I'm uh, really privileged to participate in this gardening course and to talk about my passion, which is primarily worm farming, vermicomposting. But we, we use all kinds of composting, thermophilic, the hot steaming. And if you saw the steam coming off that pile, that's cow manure in the back there that you can see um, steaming up thermophilic composting, which most people are familiar with. We talk about vermicomposting or cold composting and anaerobic composting or fermenting, also known as bokashi. We, we talk about these three main types and how you can make amazing high quality compost, which it's not about the nutrients, it's not about NPK. There's no numbers involved here. It's about microbial diversity. So you, you work with quality ingredients, and you use time, you work with nature, just like Dan has done here on the farm. He's, he's composting in place. There are, uh, you didn't see them, but there are a whole host of the soil food we have living right in here. We try to apply that into the compost pile. So, you know, if worms haven't been through your compost, your compost is inferior. And we teach you things like that, just little, little ways that you can work with nature and you can build phenomenal fertility right on your own farm or in your own garden. And if you can't do that, I'm gonna teach you how to identify quality compost so when you go shopping, just like when you're shopping for produce, you can know when and where you should be buying your compost from. Right, and one member of the gardening course instructor team that's not here today is Jack. And um, yeah. Jack focuses on, on garden design and he is going to be taking you through the, the elements of, of good garden design, whether that applies to your backyard garden or front yard garden, or maybe your whole property, or whether that applies to your market garden, um, or if you're a balcony grower, what, what you can do to enhance beauty and maximize photosynthetic, photosynthesis and carbon sequestering, um, prune trees uh, so that you can get higher production, higher yield, less disease, less pest. And so Jack is going to be navigating us through that um, really interesting dimension of, of market gardening and, and, and uh, home gardening. That's going to be an exciting addition to, to our course. So what we're trying to do right now is promote the gardening course to people who are um, thinking about purchasing a gift at this time of year. Yeah. You know? uh, we're struggling with food chain supply issues um, and I think it's uh... and inflation this this is uh, reprehensible what's going on right now we live in a time where we've been through one of the greatest challenges on the bulk of humanity meanwhile the billionaires are now even bigger billionaires the middle class and and the bulk of humanity has actually now come face to face with probably the highest inflation since the 80s or so at least in in our area and and you know it's so important to 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 do what you can in your context to produce or help support someone who wants to grow food that's key if you know somebody who's got that green thumb or green thumbs or just loves nature and wants to work help them and and this style of growing there just there's nothing better for your health and also when you work with nature, you end up using less. When you work with quality ingredients, 
you you work you just use less you know it's like those those nice pair of boots that you buy they last for 10 years yeah they, they probably cost you four or five hundred dollars or you can spend 50 bucks and get the pair that falls apart in five minutes you know so you, you don't want to teach you to empower you to help address these anxious times uh, and there's nothing better that you could do than to uh, apply yourself into getting some food security or helping someone uh, who wants to grow to do that to grow sure. food for you or your community if people head over to the localharvestgardening.com you will find a link to be able to purchase a gift for a loved one and give the gift of gardening this this winter and i think it's going to be a gift that's going to keep giving and it's going to endure long beyond the uh, 2022 growing season yeah, and that's what we're we're trying to do is empower a community of growers to uh, build food security within their community, and I, I really think that uh, a powerful movement like that is going to leave uh, an incredible mark in your community. Yeah, and um, we can work towards towards greater greater food security, more ecological mindfulness as we produce food together and for for our community so we're 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 in light uh we're joyful that we can take you on this journey with us yes and um for us it's empowering as well it is and for your mental health and for the mental health of the community the world the planet we have lost touch with the very home that supports our life you got to get your hands dirty it's good for your mental health this is a miserable time of year. This is the hardest time of year for me personally. I have really struggled with what they, you know, seasonal effectiveness disorder, or whatever you want to call it. There's just low light. And if you're stuck indoors, you, you're missing out. This is the, this is the greatest um, um, antidepressant that there is out there. And you know, we haven't even touched on indoor growing, which is something that we want to touch on uh, in the course, uh, you know, working with a grow tent, or growing uh, indoors if you in a heated greenhouse or if your climate doesn't allow you to grow like this. There are many ways to grow and to grow and work with nature. Fantastic. I look forward to you joining us on this journey. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you.